Oh, I hit I hit the wrong thing, damn it. Okay. <laughs> All right, hey everybody. Um, since I couldn't record this year's script reading, I only got about five minutes of it. We're going to make it up by reading last year's script reading. They sold books of it, and we we got lots of them. Truly comparable. Yes. <clears throat> it was only five dollars. It has illustrations in it and whatnot. So yeah, so we'll be we'll reading that for you today, and uh, well, let's go. Attention class, says Autobot Teaching Unit RC. I'd like you all to welcome a new student joining us for today's field trip to the Metroplex. This is Sari Sumdak. Sari's classmates, Nightbeak, Hosehead, and Siren, stare at her curiously. They've never seen a techno-organic before. Sari, likewise, has never been to Cybertron before. But after discovering she was part Cybertronian, she decided to join her Autobot friends Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, Bulkhead, and Ratchet, and the late lamented Prowl as they returned for, to their home planet so she could learn about her true origins. R.C. wasn't the most exciting teacher, but she was still a heck of a lot more entertaining than her old tutor bot. <clears throat> Judging from the residue on the soles of your shoes, I can deduce you are not a native to Iapon. Says Nightbeat, examining Sari carefully. Perhaps an exchange student from one of the Tri-Peninsular Tour states? Protohex or Praxis? Try Earth, Sherlock. Mutters Sari, rolling her eyes. So, like, what are all those fiber optics on top of your head about, eh? Says Hosehead. It's called hair. Mumbles a self-conscious Sari. Ew, that's so gross! Flares Siren at the top of his vocal processor. Use your inside voice, Siren. Warns RC. But we're still outside! Protests Siren as they enter the Metroplex. <laughs> The Metroplex is the center of our entire Cybertronian government, as well as our Science Guild and Intelligence Division, explains R.C., leading the class through the massive structure. It also houses an infirmary where I, myself, spent many stellar cycles after my memory had been wiped by... Oh, but you probably don't want to hear my old war stories. But the students weren't paying attention anyway. They were more focused on the contents of the strange bag Sari had brought with her. What's in the sack, eh? Asks Hosehead. Judging from the color and consistency, it's clearly some sort of exhaust port degreaser. Theorizes Nightbeat. Actually, it's a takeout from BurgerBot. Explains Sari. My dad sent it from Earth through the space bridge. Oh, the best part. Sari adds, holding up a bottle of red soda. Is this fake red... Oh, no, they forgot parentheses. Is this fake fake red bot pop? You can only get this stuff in Detroit. Ew! You're gonna digest that in your vocal processor? Shouts Siren. Inside voice, Siren, scolds R.C. Sorry, he bellows, then realizing his faux pox, whispers, I meant, sorry. <laughs> this is the Cybertronian Intelligence Division, announces R.C. as she leads the class down a secure corridor. Normally, civilians don't have access to this area, but as a former intel agent myself, I was able to pull a few circuits. Sorry was too big busy chugging down the last of her fake old red box pop to notice. She lets out a loud burp, which startles her classmates. Ew! Gross! Screams Siren, forgetting once again to use his inside voice. Was it me? Insists Sorry, trying to act innocent. Then how come I can smell the disgusting red liquid coming from your vocal processor? Inquires Nightbeat suspiciously. Yeah, what do you think we are, a bunch of noofies? Adds Hosehead. As R.C. and her classmates move on to the next stop on the tour, an embarrassed Sari decides to dispose of the evidence while no one is looking. She sneaks behind a desk and backs up to a disposal hatch to secretly toss the soda bottle in, but loses her balance and tumbles down the chute. Unfortunately, neither R.C. nor her classmates see this as they walk out the corridor. Worst classmate ever. Sari and her soda bottle tumble into the shadowy room, landing on a top of a pile of scrap metal and other debris. As she touches a strange-looking cube of compressed metal, an all-spark-like glow emits from within. Suddenly, a voice cries out from the cube. The cube is talk. Oh. The cube is talking, and very quickly. Hello, is anyone there? I can't see a thing. What happened to me? The last thing I remember is I'm running away from Long Arm Prime. Was trying to kill me. Although I have a suspicion that he was really deceptive on double agent named Shockwave, who was really pretending to be Long Arm Prime, assuming Long Arm Prime ever really existed. Sorry, is shocked at the voice. Once she can, once she can actually get a word in, and why she asks. Who's that talking? My name is Blur, and the fastest Autobot there ever is, is that, or I was before I compressed in the cube of scrap metal. I'm an Autobot intelligence agent sent to Earth by the elite guard to keep an eye on Optimus Prime and ended up helping this crew forward enough by Megatron to activate a space bridge to stage a sneak attack on Cybertron. I was inadvertently teleported to a remote sector to repair a Starscream clones, but escaped them and returned to Cybertron with Warren Long Arm Prime and Decepticon Double Agent named Shockwave in their root miss, and now I realize that so I say it out loud, I realize Long Arm Prime was a Decepticon Double Agent. Sorry, of course, I already knows the story. 
Not that she can interpret Blur's rapid-fire monologue to tell him. Zarya was a member of Optimus Prime's crew on Earth. Although she never had a chance to meet Blur, she heard Bumblebee complain about him many, uh, many times about how annoying he is. He was. And now she knows Bumblebee did not exaggerate. Zarya also realizes she must have some residual spark energy still left in her from when she used her key to upgrade herself. It's a long story. But since Zarya can't talk as fast as Blur, she doesn't have enough time to tell it. Suffice it to say, Zarya is responsible for instilling some life-giving all-spark energy into Blur and raising the hopes of fans who are left traumatized by his apparent demise. <laughs> not to mention a certain voice actor who begs us not to kill him off. Searching for an exit, Sari disco discovers an access panel and tries to use her tech-savvy powers to activate and op it and open a door. When Sari uses the key to upgrade herself, see long story above, she obtained the, the ability to communicate with machines. She used that ability to help restore RC's long-lost memories, but that's another story. The complete DVD set is still available if you're interested. Otherwise, just trust me on this. Anyway, what Sari doesn't realize is, as she activates the panel, is that she has also inadvertently activated something else. She used to do that a lot, especially in Seasons 1 and 2. But this particular something is a fan favorite gremlin-like being of pure energy named Crimzeek. Why a being of pure energy needs a name at all is beyond me, but there you have it. As Nightbeat, Siren, and Hosehead, remember them, visit the council chamber, chamber R.C. takes a headcount and realizes Sari is missing, finally. <laughs> Maybe she went up to the washroom, eh? Suggests Damn. Hosehead. Good, real Siren. I hope she's washing off that disgusting burger. I mean, how does an organic cow transform into that thing? I understand it transforms into something even worse inside of her. Adds R.C., up being the gross quotient of the story. <laughs> Nightbeat, however, perks up, excited at the turn of events. Sari's disappearance is a mystery to be solved. We just need to search for clues, interrogate witnesses, beat confessions out of snitches. We will do no such thing, young bot. Responds R.C., glaring sternly at Nightbeat. Killjoy. Mutters Nightbeat. <laughs> Suddenly, an alarm blares. A voice projects over the PA system. Intruder in recycling center. Now that sounds like a clue. Declares R.C., rushing the students out of the chamber. The lights suddenly come on to reveal that Sari and the Blur Cube are sitting on a conveyor belt that leads to a massive array of deadly looking machinery. Razor sharp shredders, pile driving mashers, and an enormous smelting furnace. Naturally, Blur has quite a bit to say about the subject. <coughs> Clearly, we've landed in the essential Cybertronian recycling plant, a facility that was utilized extensively during the Great War between the Autobots and Septicons, for which a constant supply of scrap metal was a central component in the ongoing defense efforts. Fortunately, the center has not been non operational since our hard fought victory against the ruthless fanatical Septicons. Obviating the need to slash, hack, crush, polar, scorch, melt, or otherwise mutilate discarded cybernetic components such as ourselves. But Sari notices a cackling, impish being of pure energy zap itself into the machinery, which suddenly whirls to life. Sari grabs the blur cube and <laughs> smashes and scrambles to outrun the slow moving conveyor belt and avoid being shredded by whirling blades or crushed by the pounding, smashing mashers. Been there, done that, replies. Oh, wait. Yeah, sorry. They have lots of misprints in this. The blur cube at micro machine. Machines commercial speed. And I can tell you from personal experience that I do not recommend it in the least, nor do I wish to add my ongoing list of indignities by being melted down in molten metal, super metal heat emanating from the upcoming smelting furnace directly in our path. Sorry, meanwhile, touches the equipment and uses her tech savvy powers to determine there's something inside the machinery. An intelligence. An evil intelligence. Unfortunately, Kremsleek takes the opportunity to send a zap of electricity through the works that causes traps to lash out and tie down Sar to the very belt in a classic silent movie predicament, as she and Blur move directly towards the flaming furnace. Oh no, what will happen? Do you dare turn the page to find out? We do! Phew! Blur, sorry and Blur are okay. Aren't you glad you turned that page? It seems R.C. and her classmate rushed in at the last possible second and rescued them. Hose had used his namesake hoses to douse the furnace with a powerful flame retardant foam, while R.C. used her laser blades to slice Sorry free. Siren uses, uses his sonic power to blast a, the pile drivers to smithereens, and Nightbeat jumped up the gears of the conveyor belt with several adhesive spewing pallets from her utility belt. It was a nail-biting, suspenseful action sequence that would have looked awesome in animation, but can hardly be done justice with a single storybook illustration. Don't you wish there was a season four? The season four had been produced now? Yes! Stop taunting us! What happened here? Asked R.C. Well, I was unwittingly disposed of here and left dead by the lift chamber the Hess of Long Arm Prime, who in reality was a Septicon double agent shockwave after nothing more, much happened for a very long time to remain in season 30 to be precise until the techno organic unit quite literally stumbled upon me and reignited my starting through a convenient plot device that she still carries with another. Also bringing the life of mischievous maniacal being a pure energy who sabotaged the recycling facility and attempted to lead us to an ultimate ton untimely demise. Damn it! Answers Blair, proceeding to summarize the entire story up to this point. Maniacal being of pure energy? Replies RC, miraculously picking up that crucial plot point amid Blair's endless babbling. 
You must be talking about Creme Zeke. She adds in an uncanny leap of logic that provides the necessary exposition. I remember it from my Intel days. It's an old Decepticon Trojan horse program designed to sabotage cybernetic systems capable of jumping from unit to unit if it's not contained. Sorry touches the machinery, but no longer senses the evil presence. Suddenly, Nightbeat's eyes glow red and turn crimson shape. I, Crimzeek, am now in control of this Autobot shell. She states for the readers who otherwise wouldn't be able to figure out what's happening. With that, she attacks Sari, transforms into vehicle mode, and zooms for, ex zooms for exit. I must get to Fortress Maximus now! She exclaims, conveniently revealing the villain's plot so the heroes can save the day. <laughs> RC quickly activates a control panel and seals off the room. Heavily reinforced security doors slam into place, blocking Crimzeek slash Nightbeat's escape. Fortress Maximus is the Cybertronian defense hub. If Crimson gets in there, he could destroy all of Cybertron, explains R.C., setting the stakes for the remainder of the story. The Crimson possessed Nightbeat attacks R.C., who whips out her twin laser swords and defects the attack in an impressive display of sword spot ship. No one is more impressed than Sari at the, per at the per perpetual victim R.C.'s sudden inexplicable badassery. Oh. Since when did you turn into... <laughs> Since when did you turn yourself into a Transformer Prime counterpart? She asks. Oh, these blades? Responds R.C. They were a gift from Ratchet. He was trying to make pointers for my lectures, but he got a little carried away. Just when it looks like R.C. will get the upper silver on Nightbeat, Crimson leaps out of Nightbeat and into Siren. Siren's eyes glow red and turn Crimson shape as the devilish being of pure energy forces him to use his sonic power to blast a hole in the wall. Nothing will stop Crimson from reaching Fortress Maximus! Blurs the Kremzy controlled siren in his non inside voice, once again reminding the reader of the his plan. How about a deuce of my form, eh? replies Hosehead as he deuces, I mean doses, siren with the flame retardant from his hoses, forcing Kremzy to jump out of siren and into Hosehead, who runs through the hole siren blasted. Sari pulls out her scooter, which conveniently appears out of nowhere like a Beast Wars weapon. She transforms the scooter into a jetpack and flies after Kremzeek controlled Hose Head into a tunnel. She catches up and grabs Hose Head, but as she does so, Kremzeek leaps out of Hose Head and into Sari's jetpack. Sari and Hose Head thud to the floor as Sari's jetpack soars off, now controlled by Kremzeek. Bummer, eh? Remarks Hose Head. We'll never catch Kremzeek in time, eh? Sari insists that they must. They will. Aw, oh, take off, Sari. Responds Hose Head, pronouncing her name like a true Canadian. We need, like, the fastest Autobot there is to catch up now, eh? The fastest Autobot there is. Repeats Sari, an idea forming in her techno-organic brain. Sari plugs the blur cube into her backpack. Suddenly fused with his spark or something like that, she inexplicably gains his powers and zips off after Crimson gets super speed. But before she can take off, R.C. grabs onto Sari and speeds off with her. How is this even possible? Asked Blur. I mean, even given Sari's season 3 upgrade may have given her increased strength, although it was never explicitly stated, the sheer size comparison between RC and Sari and the added burden of carrying me in cube form and back would make it extremely cumbersome to run, or energy blades skate as that case may be. At such velocity for any continuous duration, that's stretching the credibility even beyond the normal levels of the series. First of all, I doubt the artist is even going to attempt to draw this, replies RC. Second of all, I need to be around for the rest of the story because, unlike Sari, my voice actress actually showed up for the live script reading of the story at BotCon 2015. <laughs> On the streets of Iacon, Cybertron defense bots Cheetor and Sideswipe react to rapid whoosh of motion, whipping past them at sonic boom producing speed, thus providing a cameo from the Bakon 2011 comic, The Sundicon Job. Since Sideswipe retired to the Energel Farm at the end of the story, we'll just say the story takes place during the comic. Yeah, that's it. Jumping gyros! Now that's what I call fast! remarks an impressed Cheetor. You know, if I didn't know better, I'd say that was a blue version of you! Bruce Bond sideswipe, so making an obscure repaint reference. <laughs> Meanwhile, Blur acts as a GPS, rapid talking directions to Fortress Maximus to the non Cybertron familiar Sari. Alright, you want to take Avalon Bowler, pack it, pass back it down to Old Oil House, duck in the alley behind our own way, cut the sudden into Dodo Dodo Radar, straight spaceport. RC interrupts Blur, if such a thing is possible. No, you'll want to avoid all that construction at. Dole Railer. Take a detour through the underground tunnels. Then you'll bypass Trypticon Prison, come up at the Space Bridge Nexus, and cut through the Autobot Boot Camp. Autobot Boot Camp was sh shut down since the last wave of Protoforms group graduated. Did you know if you hadn't spent the final wave of the Great War in memory white coma thanks to your Metabot boyfriend? Replied Blur. First of all, he's not my boyfriend. Counters RC, although it's clear we're hinting in Season 3 that Ratchet had feelings for her. <gasps> Second of all, we can't take another route. Those are the only Cybertronian backgrounds that have been designed. Meanwhile, inside Jupiter Prison, the Decepticon captives, you didn't think we'd get through the story without seeing them, did you? 
are held in stasis lock. But that doesn't mean it stops Shockwave from realizing that his failsafe Crimson program has been activated and is on a set course to destroy all of Cybertron. Megatron asks Shockwave why he would do to create why he would create such a foolish program. We weren't supposed to be on Cybertron when it was implemented, explained Shockwave. And now there's nothing he can do to shut it down. Yeah, it is. And you were supposed to be the smart one. Crumbles Megatron. <coughs> Inside the Fortress there. Maximus Control Center, Jetfire and Jetstorm oversee the C Cybertronian defense grid with Sentinel Prime. It's Sentinel... Oh. Uh, uh, that Sentinel Magnus! Correct. Sentinel breaking the fourth wall, although he's technically only acting Magnus while Ultra Magnus recovers from the beatdown Shockwave gave him with his own hammer. Shockwave ruins everything, doesn't he? He oh. does. Nevertheless, Shockwave is too focused on his own self-importance to notice as Sari jetpacks, jetpack flies into the room, then clunks to the floor as Crimson flies out, and into the central control system. Why is enormous photon pulse cannon be activating? Asked Jetfire. And why is enormous photon pulse cannon to be aiming at City of Iacon? Asked Jetfire. Nailed it. And how did you get past security? Asked Sentinel as Sari RC and the Blur Cube suddenly whiz into the room. Blur, Blur Cube begins to rapidly recap the entire story once again, but Sari mercifully cuts him off. <coughs> she puts her hands on the control console and uses her cyber savvy ability to calculate a means of overriding Kremzik's control and shut down the cannon. Sorry, don't! warns RC. Kremzik can jump into any cybernetic system. Sure enough, Kremzik jumps out of the control console and into Sari. But the imp of pure energy is unable to take control of Sari's techno-organic system. Her ears and nose shoot out sparks as Kremzik attempts to escape. We need to find something to contain Kremzik, cries R.C., stating the obvious. Like this empty bottle of fake o red bot pop suggests Sari, pulling out the soda bottle that was so conveniently clear, cleverly introduced at the beginning of the story. With a loud burp, burp. Sari spits Kremzik out of her mouth and into the bottle and seals it up. In the Cyber Ninja Dojo, Optimus Prime and his obligatory cameo, and Jazz used the AllSpark to restore blur the Blur Cube to his former robot mode, causing half the fan base to breathe a sigh of relief and the other half to complain about the lack of real consequences in this universe. Now, class, what do we have to say to Sari for using her wits and bravery to save the day? Pa posits RC in the most leading way possible. Spitting beings of pure energy into you soda bottles is gross! It is. Declares Siren in a voice that is so not inside it could wake the well of all sparks. Augie and back bacon. Adds Hosehead, thoroughly exhausting his Canadian stereotype dialogue. We've learned to respect our differences and not judge a data tracks by its techno-organic cover. Concludes Nightbeat, wrapping up this story's theme with a pro-social bow to any that any network executive could appreciate. Meanwhile, an ecstatic blur does super speed laps around the dojo, happily declaring, I'm finally free to become a regular feature player just in Iver Season 4. What do you mean this was Season 4? Of course this is Season 4. Transformers back in Cartoon Network, isn't it? Or was in disguise? Wait, I've never used that title? Twice? Never mind, I'm going to an agent on my phone. I'm on a recurring stunt cast and guest shot and mentioned passing. Maybe I should get a voice direct. What do you think, Sue? No? <laughs> <laughs> the end. Hey. Oh, it was good. Our first try. <laughs> Alright, so hopefully that makes up for everything. Later, peeps. That was fun.